So um, you asked the question, God, why God won't go away. Um, if God's everywhere in the universe, how could God go away? <laughs> Well, that's true. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, when, we, when we asked the question about why God won't go away, we were really looking at how a number of people in the intellectual elite a couple hundred years ago were all saying that we weren't going to need religion or spirituality anymore and thought religion was going to go away pretty quickly. Uh, here we are 200 years later, and uh, obviously something's gone very wrong with that idea, and religion and spirituality are doing extremely well. There's been a resurgence of interest in traditional religions. There's been a lot of interest in uh, different approaches to spirituality, some of the quote-unquote New Age ideologies where people are trying to explore their own sense of spirituality and how it affects them and how it relates to them. And, of course, science and, and, uh, and a lot of uh, researchers are starting to take a new look at how religion and spirituality affect us and what science can help to say about those kinds of issues. So when we think about it and we look around us, we see that religion is made of some pretty tenacious material. And if that's the case, then we ask the question, well, what is it about it that makes it so tenacious? We think it ultimately has to do with how it plays out within the human brain and the human mind that it seems to map so well onto the functions of the human brain that it's something that just won't go away no matter no matter what happens to us uh, unless we have we undergo some evolutionary change to do to, that we actually our brains actually change to doing trying to do something different for us that as long as we are the way we are as human beings spirituality and religion are going to be here for a very long time so it has nothing to do with train tickets no, no, and, and it doesn't, right, and it doesn't ever, it, in, in some senses, while we could look at what the objective reality is as to whether or not there is a God or not, um, even regardless of that particular issue, uh, just because of how we are as human beings, I think we have an urge and a need to be spiritual. So whether or not there actually is a God, um, in some senses, is not necessarily as important for the question about why God won't go away. It's a part of, of who we are as human beings. And, uh, and that has, in some senses, nothing specifically to do with what the ultimate reality of the situation is. Speaking of ultimate realities, what is it? Well, ultimate reality, I think, it very frequently depends a lot on how a person perceives it and, uh, and what they actually think is, is the real reality of our world. Uh, normally, it refers to a state or an experience that is perceived to be much more real than our everyday sense of reality. Uh, it's supposedly the, the underlying cause and, and structure of the universe. What it ultimately is made of or comprised of is something that philosophers and scientists have been trying to explore for thousands of years. On one hand, I don't think we have a great answer. I think some of our research at least helps us to understand how to frame those questions. And when we do look at some of the uh, very profound spiritual experiences, we do see that there is a, a significant uh, understanding in mystical experiences of what some fundamental level of reality would be and what it is, how it relates to us in this reality. And uh, so we, we certainly, I think, have a, a lot to look at as far as what the spiritual experiences are of ultimate reality and what that may mean, whether or not science actually will even have access or at least complete access to that kind of, uh, that aspect of reality, or whether science is still more restricted to our everyday sense of reality. Those are going to be some important questions that we're going to have to explore in the future. Can the, um... No. I, I'm just, I'm just rolling here. Because I keep thinking, you know... Hold on, stand by for one second. Don't you think it's going to look silly if we Greek it, though? And well, but would you, it's either being sued or having a Greek monitor. I mean, it's... Adele? Again, Adele for Yeah. Um, I don't know. Mark, what's your opinion of the... Uh, See, I think, I think we could be all right because we're using a... Rea this is a reality situation, don't, don't you think? Don't worry about the computer. Yeah. Okay, we're not worrying about it. Can I, can I do that? You, no, no, it just looks silly. I, what was your question? My question is only, are you guys... Are you hearing this beep off the camera? Are you okay with that? It's, I didn't All right, then it's it. fine. I don't it's been, it's been there since well, the beginning of the What? Can you just run the animation while we're talking? No, we're ready to go again. Um, oh, yeah, oh, I see. Right in the background. Oh, I see. Yeah, why don't you just go ahead and... Why, well, you're the monitor out there, Marky? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Well, make sure you move the paper because it's covering your face. And oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, God, what was the question? Um, Ultimate reality. Ah. Is there any... How does the brain tell what's re real and what's not real? Is there any way the brain can know what's real or not real? 
It's not a clear explanation as to why our brain thinks that something feels real. There are certainly parts of our brain that help us to interpret the information that we have within ourselves, uh, that is, comes into us from the outside world, that allows us to put together a very vivid picture of what's going on out there. But why we actually perceive that sense of reality to be the most real is not a clear uh, answer. There's not a clear answer to that yet. People have done some studies looking at hallucinations and what the difference is between something that somebody envisions to be real versus something that somebody actually does see and what the differences are in the brain. It does appear to have something to do with parts of the brain called the limbic system, which is involved in our emotional processing, and also another structure called the anterior cingulate, which is very involved in our ability to process emotions and also to focus our mind and focus our attention on different things. So it may be some relationship between these structures and these functions that actually identify something as being real and having that that realness feel to it, but why that happens and, and exactly why that happens in particular circumstances and why certain types of experiences like dreams may feel a little less real than our everyday reality and why mystical experiences feel more real than our everyday reality is, is not something that's clear at this point. Uh, so it, it, it's a very important question that we have to address, but uh, it, it really, and it stems from a very important problem that we as human beings must face, which is how do we really know what's out there, what's outside of our brains, and is there some way that we can get outside of our brains uh, or, or have the brain get out of its own way in order to see what is really out there. Uh, and I think that while on one hand science helps us to get part of the way there, what's interesting is that in these mystical experiences that people have, one of the descriptions that they give to it is that it is perceived of as being prior to uh, a subjective or objective sense of reality, meaning that it is it's really something that exists before we as human beings begin to apply our mental processes to it. It's something that, which is why it feels so fundamentally real. But what, so it's possible that through spiritual practices and spiritual experiences that we gain access to some level of reality that we don't normally have access to. The real question though is, is how are we actually able to do that? And what is it that we're actually touching when we do touch those levels? When people have a, a, a mystical experience, what usually happen, how they describe it is that they begin to lose the usual sense of material reality around them. In fact, if they go far enough and they achieve a sense of absolute unitary experience, then all of the material world as we typically know it basically goes away. What we're talking about there is an experience of just pure being, pure awareness, pure consciousness. So it's not, it's not necessarily tied to anything material. And because those experiences 